what about the the realm of ideas so like you know i'm i'm a big believer uh this guy named cal newport who wrote a book mm-hmm. about deep work oh, yeah i love that book <laughs> yeah he's great uh so he i mean one of the nice things i've always practiced deep work but he it's it's always nice to have words uh put to the the concepts that you've practiced it somehow makes them more concrete and allows you to uh to get better it, it turns it into a skill that you can get better at but you know i also value deep thinking where you think it's almost meditative. You think about a particular concept for long periods of time. The programming you have to do that kind of thing for. You just have to hold this concept, like, like you you hold it and then you take steps with it. You take further steps and you you're holding relatively complicated things in your mind as you're thinking about them. And there's a lot of, I mean, the hardest part is there's uh, frustrating things like. You take a step and it turns out to be the wrong direction. So you have to calmly turn around and take a step back. And then it's, you're kind of like exploring through the space of ideas. Is there something about your study of optimal performance that could be applied to the act of thinking mm. as opposed to action? Well, we haven't done uh, too much work there, but what? Um, but I think I can comment on it yeah. from a neuroscience yeah, perspective, what's your which is really all I do is, yeah. uh, well, I, I mean, we do experiments in the lab, but um, looking at things through the lens of neuroscience. So what you're describing um, can be mapped fairly well to working memory, just keeping things online and updating them as they change in information is coming back into, into your brain. Uh, Jack Feldman, who I'm a huge fan of and um, fortunate to be friends with, is a uh, professor at UCLA, works on respiration and breathing, but he has a physics background. And, um, and so he thinks about respiration and breathing in terms of ground states and how they modulate other states. Very, very interesting and I think um, important work. Jack uh, has an answer to your question. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to get this exactly right because this is lifted from a coffee conversation that we had about a month ago. (laughs) But uh, so um, apologies in advance for the, but I think I can get mostly right. So we were talking about this, about how the brain updates cognitive states depending on demands and thinking in particular. And he used an interesting example. I'd be curious to know if you agree or disagree. Uh, He said, you know, most great mathematics is done by people in their late teens and 20s, Mm -hmm. and even you could say early 20s, sometimes into the late 20s, but not much further on. Maybe I just insulted some mathematicians. No, that's that's, that's true. And I think that it demands, his argument was, um, there's a tremendous demand on working memory to work out theorems in math and to keep a number of plates spinning, so to speak, mentally and run back and forth between them, updating them. In physics, Jack said, and I I'm incl- I think this makes sense to me too, that there's a reliance on working memory, but an increased reliance on some sort of deep, deep memory and deep memory stores, probably stuff that's moved out of the hippocampus and forebrain and into the cortex and is um, more some episodic and declarative stuff, but really, so you're, you're pulling from your library, basically. Mm-hmm. It's not all RAM, it's not all working memory. And then in biology, that, and physicists tend to have very active careers into their you know 30s and 40s and 50s and so forth, um, sometimes later. And that in biology, you see careers that are, have a much longer arc, you know, kind of these protracted careers often, uh, people still in their 60s and 70s doing, doing really terrific work not always doing it with their own hands because the right. people in the labs are doing them, of course. But um, And that work does tend to rely on insights gained from having a very deep knowledge base where you can remember a paper and a, or maybe a figure in a paper. You could go look it up if you wanted to, but it's very different than the working memory of the mathematician. And so when you're talking about coding or being in that tunnel of thought and trying to iterate and keeping a lot of plates spinning, it it speaks directly to working memory. My lab hasn't done too much of that. With working memory? But we are pushing working memory when we have people do things like these simple lights out tasks while they're under, we can increase the cognitive load by increasing the level of autonomic arousal to the mm-hmm. point where they start doing less well. Yeah. And you know everyone has a cliff, 
this is what's kind of fun. We've had um, you know SEAL team operators come to the lab. We've had people from other units in the military. Very you know we've had a range of of intellects and backgrounds and all sorts of things. And everyone has a cliff, and those cliffs uh, sometimes show up as a function of the demands of speed of processing or how many things you need to keep online. I mean, we're all limited at some point in the number of things we can keep online. So what you're describing is very interesting because it, I think it has to do with how narrow or broad the information set is. Because, And I don't prog I'm don't i not an active programmer, so um, this is a regime I don't really fully know. So I don't wanna comment about it uh, in, that, in any way uh, that, that you know, doesn't suggest that. But I think that what you're talking about is top-down control, so this is prefrontal cortex, keeping every bit of reflexive circuitry at bay, mm -hmm. the one that makes you wanna get up and use the restroom, the one that makes you wanna check your phone, the, all of that, but also running these anterior thalamus to prefrontal cortex loops, which we know are very important for working memory. Yeah, let me try to think through this a little bit. So reducing the process of thinking to working memory access is tricky. He's probably ultimately correct. But if I were to say some of the most challenging things that uh, an engineer has to do and a, scient a scientific thinker, I would say it's kind of depressing to think that we do that best in our 20s, but is uh, this kind of first principles thinking step of, of saying you, you're accessing the things that you know and then saying, well, let me, how do I do this differently than I've done it before? This this weird like stepping back, like, is this right? Let's try it this other way. That That's the most mentally taxing step. It's like, you, you've gotten quite good at this particular pattern of how you solve this particular problem. So there's a, there's a pattern recognition first. You're like, okay, I know how to, I build a thing that solves this particular problem in programming, say. And then the question is, but can I do it much better? And I don't know if that's, I don't know what the hell that is. I don't know if that's accessing working memory. That's that's almost access, maybe it is accessing memory in a sense it's trying to find similar patterns in a totally different place that it could be uh, projected onto this. But you're you're it's you're not querying uh, facts. You're querying like functional things, like <laughs> yeah, it's patterns. I mean, you're patterns. running out. You're you're testing algorithms. Yeah, right. You're testing algorithms. I, yes. So I want to just um, because I know uh, some of the people listening to this and you have have basis in you know scientific training and have scientific training. So I want to be clear. I think we can be correct about some things like the role of working memory in these yeah. kinds of processes without being exhaustive. We're not saying right. they're the only right. thing. We're not, right. you know, we can be correct, but not assume that that's the only thing involved, right? right? And I mean, neuroscience, let's face it, is still in its infancy. Right. I mean, we probably know 1% of what there is to know about the brain. Um, you know, we've learned so much and yet there may be global states that underlie this that make prefrontal circuitry work differently than it would in a, in a different regime or even time of day. I mean, there's a lot of mysteries about this. But so I just want to make sure that we we sort of are we're aiming for precision and accuracy, <laughs> but but we're not we're gonna be, that. we're not gonna be exhausted. <laughs> yeah. So there's a difference there. And I think uh, you know, sometimes in the vastness of the internet, uh that gets forgotten. Um so th <laughs> the other is that um you know we we think about um you know we think about these operations uh at you know, really focused, keeping a lot of things online. But what you were describing is actually um, it it speaks to the the very real possibility, probably that that with certainty, there's another element to all this, which is when you're trying out lots of things, in particular, lots of different algorithms, you don't want to be in a in a state of very high autonomic arousal. That's not what you want because the higher level of autonomic arousal and stress in the system, the more rigidly you're going to analyze space and time. Right. And what you're talking about is playing with space-time dimensionality. And I want to be very clear. I mean, I'm the son of a physicist. I am not a physicist. When I talk about space and time, I'm literally talking about visual space and 
how long it takes for my finger to move from this point to this point. You, you are facing a tiger and trying to figure out how to avoid being eaten by the tiger. And that's primarily going to be determined time. by the visual system in humans. Yeah. We don't walk through space, for instance, like a scent hound would and look at three-dimensional scent plumes. You know, when a scent hound goes out in the environment, they have depth to their odor trail, the odor trails they're wow. following. And that's they don't awesome. think about them. It, it, we don't think about odor trails. You might say, oh, well, the smell's getting more intense. Aha. Yeah. But they actually have three-dimensional odor yeah. trails. So they see a yeah. cone of odor. See, of course, with their nose, yeah. with their olfactory cortex. We do that with our visual system. And we parse time, often subconsciously, with, mainly with our visual system, also with our auditory system. And this shows up for the musicians out there, metronomes are a great way to play with this. Um, you know, bass drumming, when the frequency of bass drumming changes, you, your perception of time changes quite a lot. So in any event, space and time are linked in the, through the sensory apparatus, through the eyes and ears and nose, and um, probably through taste too, and through touch um, for us, but mainly through vision. So when you drop into some coding or iterating through a creative process or trying to solve something hard, you can't really do that well if you're in a rigid um, high level of autonomic arousal because you're plugging in algorithms that are in this space regime, this time regime matches. It's space time matched. Whereas creativity, I always think the lava lamp is actually a pretty good example, even though it has these counterculture, new agey connotations, because you actually don't know which direction things are going to change. And so in drowsy states, hmm. sleeping and drowsy states, space and time become dislodged from one another somewhat, and they're very fluid. And I think that's why a lot of solutions come to people after sleep and naps 